Let's go ahead and move into our Conference USA Part 2 previews. Now, we discussed the bottom of the conference last week. But now we are going to talk about those that finished at the top. There are only 11 schools left in Conference USA as of right now. Of course, some of those will be moving over to the AAC. And then you will have a whole batch of new ones that are moving into Conference USA next year. So this is the last year that we will see this format. Uh, There are no divisions. We are just going to talk about those teams and the way that the schedule shape up, etc. But let's go ahead and move into the previews. And we will start off with, and that's not the right page. Let's jump into this one. All right. We'll start off with the UTSA Roadrunners and, of course, Jeff Trailer. Magnificent job last year. By the way, anybody that wants to know, I will be posting these. I've gotten a lot of questions on Twitter and whatnot about where they can get these spreadsheets. These are just my personal notes, spreadsheets, but I'm going to post them on the website, winningcureseverything.com. So go ahead and make sure you bookmark the website and check frequently. I'm going to post them up, and I'll let you guys know on the show when they are posted. Uh, But I might actually start sending out these as images on Twitter so that everybody can have them if they want them. So uh, I do appreciate you guys asking, for sure. UTSA went 12-2 and last year, lost the bowl game. Uh, If you look at the post-game win expectancy for them last season, uh, this was closer to like a 9-4 and team, uh, 9.18 and 3.82. They did win the Conference USA Championship game. It was in their house in the Alamo Dome against Western Kentucky. Uh, Big losses. Uh, Left tacker Spencer Buford, uh, the defensive end Lorenzo Dantzler, uh, Charles Wiley, the linebacker, Tariq Woolen, the cornerback, of course, ran a ridiculous time that was later found out to not be totally accurate, but he he was still fast. And then, of course, the running back, Sincere McCormick, which I was really worried was going to be a big part of their rebuilding this year. Their, their returning production is 72%. That's number 34 in the country, so it's pretty good. And the offense brings back 82%, which is awesome. Uh, you look at some of these numbers, for the most part, fairly average. But when it comes to PPA per drive, number 28 in the country, that was really good. Number 11 passing success rate in the country, which if you look at Frank Harris and you think that he is just a running quarterback, etc., that is not the case. He is actually a very, very good quarterback. So... Looking at this from the offensive side of the ball, uh, they lost offensive coordinator Barry Lunny Jr. He went over to Illinois with uh, Brett Bielema. They should remain good under the co-OCs. Will Stein and Matt Maddox, I I believe the trailer's got a lot of faith in these guys. And those two have a lot to work with here. I don't know which one of them's going to be calling plays. I was not able to find any of the notes anywhere. If any of you uh, UTSA fans want to toss those out to me, I would love to know who's actually calling the plays. Uh, as good as Sincere McCormick was, the offense was still number 72 in rushing success rate last year. That's definitely not great. Uh, and while I said that that's the one that I was worried about you losing because he was a workhorse last year, they do get Arkansas running back Traylon Smith transferring in. Now, his numbers at Arkansas last year were not great. He had to deal with injuries, etc. But Smith is a really talented running back, and I think he's going to be awesome in this offense. Frank Harris, I said, of course, returns along with wide receiver Zakari Franklin. Four seniors on the offensive line, um, and the transfer left uh, left tackle Payne Abair from Northwestern is coming in. I think he could be an immediate starter as well. Uh, this offense looks like it's going to be just fine, just fine. At number twenty eight in PBA per drive. I don't know how replicable that is this season, especially losing your offensive coordinator and uh, McCormick at running back. But they got the pieces in place to be able to do the same thing that they've been doing. Uh, the schedule is a little bit more difficult for sure, especially early on. But, yeah, this is still going to be a good football team for sure. Defense, co-DC Rod Wright left for a job with Miami. So, the defense now solely on Jess Lepp. Uh, Defense, not the reason that they won 12 games last year, obviously. You look at some of those numbers. PPA per drive, they were number 67. So, they basically had to outscore a lot of teams. Uh, When you look at the rushing success rate, they were pretty good there. Pretty good there along the front lines. Number 52 in that spot. But passing success, they were number 90. Uh, That's not good. And obviously, when you play Western Kentucky two times with Bailey Zapp and and that bunch, Zach Kitley's offense, yeah, it's going to hurt your passing success rate. But that was not the only issue that they had last year. Uh, Explosive play rate, number 88, that's not good. Uh, They don't need to allow that much this year. They've got a lot of talented guys as far as the secondary is concerned. Uh, No defensive lineman returning with over 358 snaps, which, again, Sounds like 
a lot, but it's, there's not a lot of these guys coming in. They do have six guys with 190 to 358 snaps, so they, they do have some experience. This unit can produce better this year. I wonder if any philosophical change on the offense is going to have an immediate impact on the defense. I'm very curious about that. Uh, top players, of course, Traylon Smith. I brought him up. Frank Harris, Sakari Franklin. Uh, the right tackle, Makai Hart. Uh, the safety, Rashad Wisdom. And the linebacker, Trevor Harmonson. Those are guys to look out for. Keys to the season, Frank Harris, number eight in passing efficiency, number 11 success rate. Um, I, you got to ask about the offensive coordinator. Like, do you miss Barry Lenny that much? Losing four of the front seven on defense could sting. There is obvious talent there. Jeff Trailer has loaded this cupboard. Um, What will leadership changes on both sides of the ball mean? That's another question. Well, while you got a bunch of these same players coming back, do they match the same ideas that the coaches had, that the leadership had before those coordinators? Team was number 21 in net points per drive and number 55 in PPA margin. Uh, if the defense can step up, this can legitimately be a top 25 caliber team and not just in the G5 or whatever. This can be one of the premier teams in the country if you can get the defense to play at an above average level because this offense is stacked with talent. So the defense has talent too, but we got to see it before we do anything else. So uh, my record for them, by the way, let me pull that back up. Uh, I have them 9-3. and three. I've got losses at UAB. I've got a loss to Houston, and I've got a loss uh, at Texas. I've got them beating Army and then beating everybody else in Conference USA. So I think I think they're still going to be really, really good. It just may not be the same, you know, 12-1 and one that they were heading into a bowl game last season. Still going to be really good, though. Still going to be really good. Uh, we'll move on from there, and Western Kentucky, you talk about a team that is changing a lot. This year, uh, Tyson Helton and in that bunch, I mean, you can't lose as much on the offensive side as, as they did and expect to have anything even close to what they had last year. But uh, they are certainly going to try. You look at their numbers here, number 55, or sorry, number 104 in returning production. That's 55%, but the offense is where they really hurt. Only 43% returning production. They had a bunch of guys transfer out, as well as losing Bailey Zapp to the NFL. Zach Kitley, of course, went back to Texas Tech. That's going to hurt. Um, Mitchell Tinsley transferred out. The left tackle, Cole Spencer, is gone. Right tackle, Mason Brooks, is gone. Jeremiah uh, uh, Stearns, excuse me, is gone. Like, this is... I said Jeremiah. It's Jareth Stearns. Good gracious. My, my mind is everywhere today. My apologies, guys. Uh, so, with Western Kentucky, let's look at the offense here. Their numbers last year were like blow you off the page kind of stuff. At number three in PPA per drive, number 15 in rushing success rate, number three in passing success rate. And you know what? I'm going to zoom in on this. There we go. You might be able to see that a little bit better. Uh, PPA per drive, number three. Rushing success rate, number 15. And this is for a team that really didn't run the ball all that much. They were much more a, a fling it around the yard kind of offense. Uh, The passing success rate, number three. Explosive play rate, number 48. And I know everybody looks at that and says, wait a minute, explain explosive play rate. It's just what it says. Uh, They ran a ton of plays last year. Like, a total plays per game for this team, they were number three in the country. So, yeah, you're not going to break a ton of explosive plays in regards to or compared to the rest of the plays that you run when you run that many plays. So, yeah, they did have some explosive plays, but... Uh, when it when you look at the numbers, it's not quite that much. So they, they were still very effective. Turnover margin, they were number 12. As many plays as they ran, they really did not turn the ball over that much, and they were able to get turnovers from the other team, so that's definitely good. Looking at the changeover in offensive coordinator, 26-year-old offensive coordinator and quarterback coach Ben Arbuckle. He was the assistant quarterback coach and an offensive quality control coach last year. This guy learned under Kitley. And, and he is the youngest coordinator in Division One football. I'm curious what this is going to mean. And obviously, they want him to run the same thing that Kitley ran. Does he have the leadership qualities to be able to do that? Does he have the same kind of ideas? Or is he going to change up the philosophy a little bit? And does Tyson Helton trust him enough to allow him to do that? I'm not 100% certain. This offense lost a lot of talent as far as roster strength goes, thanks to our guys over at CFB Winning Edge. 
They were number 113 out of 131 in roster strength on offense. That is not good when you were trying to come up with something that can uh, go fast, etc. You need talent in there to do that, and you need depth. And I don't know that they've got either of those. They do have some talent, for sure. They they got transfer quarterback Jared Dagey, the starter, coming in. Um, the question there, of course, if you watched the Bet U.S. College Football Show with us last year, Jared Dagey was known on our show as Schrodinger's quarterback. You never knew what version of him you were going to get. He's going to be running something completely different in this than he did at West Virginia uh, and, and before that at Bowling Green. So uh, can Austin Reed from D2 West Florida beat him out? I doubt it because Dagey's been around forever. He's a senior. He, he's he got a good work ethic from everything that I've heard. Uh, and I put on here, like, what will the offense even look like? I would imagine it looks very similar to what Kitley did. But can you do that when you're missing some of the guys that they are missing now? Starting offensive lineman left, along with the wide receiver Stearns and Tinsley. Um, yeah, and then the quarterback, of course. Uh, the offense is going to rely on transfers at basically every level, but not to the same extent, I guess. Uh, this is going to be interesting to see what they end up doing because this team leaned on that offense last year. Uh, and that'll lead us into the defense here. The new D.C. is Tyson Summers, who, of course, was the head coach at Georgia Southern not that long ago. Uh, he was a former Colorado defensive coordinator. So, 14 players return on this defense with 300-plus snaps last year. That's good. You've got experience there. The defense was putrid last year. But again, that's because the offense moves so fast. Anytime you have an offense that runs like that, the defense is going to take a step back. They were number 93 in defensive uh, points predicted, predicted points added per drive, so PPA per drive. Uh, number 96 in rushing success rate allowed. Number 96 in passing success rate allowed. But they were number 31 in explosive play rate. So that's good. Uh, the question, of course, is like how many plays were actually run compared to how many explosive plays. So uh, with, with the offensive philosophy change or what we assume will be a slight change, what are we going to look like on defense here? Um, they're studs on defense. The, the defensive end, Jones, linebacker, Hunter, all that. The efficiency in this situation is going to be linked to the offense. This is such an interesting program with Western Kentucky. Uh, you never know what you're going to have from year to year. And they have gone from being one of the best defensive teams in Tyson Helton's first season to not really having any kind of an identity in the second year. Third year, they're a highly... Uh, offensive team, right? You bring in Kitley, and you bring in that Houston Baptist offense. And now, I don't know what the actual identity of the locker room is, what they want to be. Do they want to be this high-flying offense? Do they want to go back to where the defense is actually pretty good? I'm not sure. This year is going to be pretty interesting, I think. Uh, keys to the season here, offense likely to regress. Defense has to be better. Uh, the offense coordinator, Ben Arbuckle, is young, Um do they attempt the same offense? I'm going to ask that question over and over and over again. I, I just want to know. I do have a lot of faith in Tyson Hilton. I believe he can be a good coach. Uh, I don't know if he can figure things out this year. Uh, the early season schedule is forgiving, and they have a bye week before they play against Indiana. Uh, transferring in an entire offense in 21, and now they lose all of it, uh, that's concerning. Like yeah, They lost 11 guys to transfer. What, what do you gain? What does your program gain from something like that? It, they did get a lot of pub last year for the kind of numbers that were put up and everything, but when those guys leave, what does it mean going forward? It, was it just an extension so that Tyson Hilton doesn't lose his job earlier? Or, you know, I, that's what I'm curious about for this season. Looking at the schedule, I've got them at 6-7. and seven. They do play Hawaii early. They play on the road at Hawaii in Week 1. They've got a Week 0 game against Austin P. You can get wins in both of those. Even as you were trying to figure things out, you have a bye week before you play at Indiana. But this looks like a 6-7 and seven kind of football team to me. Uh, even with the 13 games, it's just, I mean, you've got some rough games. They play at UTSA, at Indiana, at Hawaii, at Auburn, at Charlotte, at Florida Atlanta. This, this is tough. This is very, very difficult. So, while I am curious about everything that's going on with this bunch, Number 104 in returning production and a schedule like this, six and seven, and that'll get them to a bowl game. I think that would be a success. Now, do I think that they could probably lose more than seven games? Yeah, yeah. 
Do I think that if everything goes right and Arbuckle's offense is exactly like Kitley's and they hit with Jared Dagey and they hit with some of these wide receivers? Yeah, they could be really good again. But my my money would not be on it, for sure. So I'm going with 6-7 and seven on Western Kentucky. And with that said, let's, uh, let's knock out some more ads and then we'll hit the last three of the Conference USA Part 2. Let's take a break from the show for just a minute to give you some info on things you should know about. Follow the show on Twitter, at Winning Cures, or you can follow the guys at GaryWCE and at Chris B. Giannini, or you can also follow us on Facebook. If you want more content from me, Gary, visit BetUSTV.com. I host the How to Gamble on Sports show, and from August through January, the BetUS College Football Show. You can subscribe to both on YouTube. Got your own podcast or web show? Looking to start one? Or you're just curious how we look and sound so good? Well, we've got all the gear that we use listed on our gear page on the website. If you order using our links, you'll be supporting the show too. If you're interested in advertising on a show that reaches over 80,000 unique football fans per month during the season, send an email to Gary at winningcureseverything.com and we'll put together a plan that best fits you or your business. And now... Back to the show. All right, now let's dive into UAB. And the Blazers last year, pretty good. Pretty good, not bad. Went 9-4. and Bill Clark's team is always incredibly well coached uh, every single season. It does not matter who's returning. It doesn't matter. You You have a foundation. You have a floor for this program, and they tend to reach over it almost every single season. If you look into, um, let's look into the losses here. Uh, obviously, Antonio Moultrie going to Miami hurt. Uh, Ray J. Johnson, the wide receiver, heading over to Troy. Uh, that one may hurt. They lose Garrett Prince, the tight end. He was highly used last year. Linebacker Alex Wright is a big loss there. They are number 51 in returning production, 66%. The biggest problem that you're going to have is on offense, where they only have 64% returning. But defense is number 44 in the country. You got a bunch of experienced guys here. Uh, let's start off on the offense here. Quarterback, uh, quarterback pff, <laughs> again, having problems talking today, guys. Dylan Hopkins returns uh, after a massive year last year. He missed spring. Is that going to matter? You got other guys in here that could be vying for that job. Dylan Hopkins surprised a lot of people because I think we all thought the quarterback last year was going to be Tyler Johnston. He has uh, transferred out. Now you got Hopkins, and you do have some other guys. Uh, a Baylor transfer came in, et cetera. We'll see what all that means. I would imagine Hopkins is going to be the guy, especially with as well as he played last year. Uh, offensive line returns three starters. you got some other guys that have some snaps as well, so you do have experience on the front line there. Uh, skill positions are loaded. Wide receiver could use a little more explosivity uh, beyond Trey uh, Shropshire's 26-yard ca- per catch average. The running back, you got four legit threats there. The offense is going to be good this year. Uh, You look at their numbers last year, number 18 in PPA per drive on offense, number 35 in rushing success rate, number 54 in passing success rate. Explosive play rate is number 22, which makes sense because they are number 121 in total plays run per game. Uh, When you don't run that many plays and yet you still have some explosive plays, yeah, your your number there is going to be pretty big. So I I do like the offense here. Uh, You've got McBride and Brown Jr. as far as the running backs go. Kadeem Telfort, the uh, left tackle, he's back. That's going to be good. And, of course, Hopkins, we got to see what goes on with that. Uh, I would imagine he'll be just fine. On defense, Bill Clark's defenses are always good. They always have been. He puts an emphasis on that side of the ball. They were number 43 in PPA per drive, so they weren't as good last year as usual. Still really, really good when you combine that with a good offense, right? Number 28 in rushing success rate allowed. Number 43 in passing success rate allowed. Their explosive play rate, number 86. This is another one of those where... You don't run a lot of plays, and yet you still give up some big ones. Yeah, your your play rate there is going to be pretty high. So, uh, the back seven loaded uh, there with linebacker Wilder, the cornerback Starling Thomas the fifth, star swoops, um, or swoops, excuse me. While the back seven has multiple starters back, the defensive line not nearly as experienced. There were plenty of upperclassmen though. Like this whole defense is littered with juniors and seniors just all over the place, and they are every year. They are going to miss. Linebacker Alex Wright, though, he was a star. And so I, I think 
Uh, I think they're going to miss him quite a bit. Uh, keys to the season here. The quarterback Hopkins, of course, it, he has to be as good as he was in 2021. They're going to need tight ends to step up in place of Prince here. Um, they got to help efficiency. And then, of course, as I said, you need another playmaker uh, beyond Trey Shropshire. Uh, the defense roster strength ain't great. They're number 102 in roster strength on that, but they they are number 44 in returning production, which means they've got experience. And, again, they got a lot of upperclassmen. they got a lot of studs here. They need to cut down on the penalties. That's a big key to the season this year, number 127 in penalties per game. They, they found a way to beat themselves in some of these games. Uh, those penalties typically find a way to come back and hurt you. So number 127 out of 130 last season ain't good. You got to cut down on the penalties. They were okay in turnover margin, number 43 in that regard. Uh, the schedule, I think, sets up pretty well here. I've got, I've got them at 10-2. and two. And I may be a little bit biased because, of course, Chris and I both big Bill Clark fans. But when you look at this team and you look at the way that they have gone about building the culture of the program, this second year with Dylan Hopkins, you got a pretty good defense coming back. You got some studs here and there littered with upperclassmen that understand their roles on this team. Uh, I've got losses at Florida Atlantic and at LSU. Other than that, I've got them winning every other game. Uh, I think this is this schedule set up perfectly. Your road games at Liberty, at Rice, at Western Kentucky, at Florida Atlantic, at LSU, and at Louisiana Tech. I mean, you got some first year coaches in there. You got some coordinator changeovers. You got uh, new quarterbacks. You got all kind of different stuff going on. They've they've got a shot to really do something special this year. Ten and two could get them back to the conference title game. And yeah, I I like this team a lot. I think they are loaded this year. So that leaves us with two more teams to discuss, and we'll talk about the da, 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 Middle Tennessee Blue Raiders. And, of course, write my time down on this. Rick Stockstill's Middle Tennessee Blue Raiders went 7-6 and six last year, and i got to tell you, I did not see it coming. And I will go ahead and, spoiler alert, let you know that I don't foresee that kind of record coming again this season. They're number 106 in returning production. That's 54%. Uh, their postgame win expectancy last year was 5.5 wins or so. They ended up going 7-6. and six. You know, they were right around where they were supposed to be, and they were shocking down the stretch. I, if you look at the offense, numbers were not good. They found a way to look a little bit better towards the end of the season, but overall season, number 110 in offensive PPA per drive, number 111 in rushing success rate, number 103 in passing success rate, and they were number 26 in explosive play rate. So there was no continuity. There was no... Uh, you couldn't count on anything, but they found a way to have a lot of big plays. I'll say that. Uh, because they, they were number 28 in total plays per game. Like, they ran a lot of plays. The offensive coordinator is Mitch Stewart. He was Samford's offensive coordinator, and that is Samford in Birmingham, D2 school, uh, or FC, FBS, FCS, whatever. Samford, the Samford Bulldogs, of course, where Jimbo and Terry Bowden and all that bunch came from. Uh, he loves to pass the football. Like, loves to pass the football. Does Nick Vatiato continue as the quarterback, or does Chase Cunningham come back and take the starting job after injury? Which one of these is a better passer? Because that is who Stewart is going to want as his quarterback. And I don't know right now. Nick was 4-2 and two as a starter at the end of last season, um, at least in the regular season. So the wide receivers, uh, Alley and Lane, along with Kansas State transfer running back Joe Irvin, they have playmaker ability. They, they will fit into this offense well. They did lose four offensive linemen, though. They're going to need development for Juco's, and that's not something that you typically see from Stockstill, but it was obvious that he needed help at this position up front because they didn't have a bunch of dudes. They they just didn't. So they were going to need help there. They brought in a bunch of guys. Uh, you don't have a bunch of experience there. On offense, 55% returning production. Defense is even worse, 53% returning production. That's number 104 in the country. And their offensive roster strength is number 121. Defensive roster strength, number 104. The defense is what led the way for them at the end of last season. Uh, we'll move over to that side of the ball. Number 35 in PP Upper Drive, they could not stop people from rushing the football. Number 100 in rushing success rate allowed. Number 40 in passing success rate allowed. And number 81 in explosive play rate allowed on defense. 
Scott Schaefer, of course, D.C., been there for a little while. Uh, the D-line is experienced. Defensive end Ferguson and cornerback Teldrick Ross, major havoc producers. That was a big reason why they had success last year. The secondary returns five guys with 200-plus snaps, so that's always good. As good as the defensive line appears, um, again, they allowed people to run on them quite a bit last year. Can they maintain this number 35 PPA per drive? The schedule sets up with a lot of teams that I believe like to run the football and will be able to kind of bully them around. I don't like the schedule for them this year at all. Uh, the keys to the season here, they brought in only five transfers. All five were P5 guys. Uh, what I'm curious about is Stock's still 64 years old. He has been here for a very long time. How long does he want to keep doing this? Uh, defense was key to the late season rally. There's proven pieces, but not a ton of experience. Like, can this defense be as good as 2021? Because if the offense does not click, you are going to need them uh, to lean on again. And that's what they did at the end of last season. Uh, the quarterback battle is going to be interesting. There's good skill pieces, offensive line. It's probably going to be a bit of an adventure. But again, this is a an offensive coordinator that likes to throw the football. He is probably going to get it out of the quarterback's hands quickly. So there are ways to scheme around a bad offensive line. Uh, what I want to know is what the offensive coordinator is going to do with the offense. Like, Is he going to stick to what he's known for, or is he going to try and find a way to throw in more run elements, etc.? It depends on really the quarterback that he chooses here. I, I've got... I've got them at four and eight here. Uh, I've got wins over Florida International, Charlotte, uh, Tennessee State, and at Colorado State because obviously Jay Norvell at Colorado State going to be dealing with a lot of changeover. That's going to be interesting. So a loss to James Madison early, a loss to Miami, uh, et cetera. So I, I think I think that's the way that um, that's the way that I would go on this, and we will. We'll move off of them. Four and eight for Middle Tennessee. Let's close out with this one. The North Texas Mean Green. Now, this could be an interesting season for Seth Luttrell. They went six and seven last year. They finally made it back to a bowl game, but that is his third straight losing season. And I am not sure what to make of this team. Their postgame win expectancy last year, 6.36 and 5.64. Uh, that's right on par with where they were. They finished 6-6. Six and six. Um, they, they did good in conference last year. Started out very poorly. Finished, I mean, super strong on the back half of the schedule. But this was not an offensive team, and that's what Seth Luttrell has always been known for. When he didn't get out of there when he had a chance to replace... Uh, Bill Snyder at Kansas State, you you kind of thought he would just keep things rolling in North Texas, but he hasn't been able to hit on a quarterback in quite some time. Again, six and seven last year, they were nine and four against the spread. This was a pretty decent football team. They're number thirty in returning production, seventy three percent, and even better than that on offense, eighty four percent coming back on offense. The problem with that is that it wasn't the offense that they leaned on last year. It was the defense. Defense was number 28 in PPA per drive. The offense was number 81 in that regard. Uh, we'll start off with the offense here. Uh, obviously, the, the losses. The running back, DeAndre Torrey, he was a boss last year. Absolute boss. But they do have some running backs that played really, really well last year. So you still got your number two and number three options. Uh, the end of the season was led by a rushing offense there, uh, along with that defense. While you're losing the running back, Torrey, you got a three-headed beast with Ragsdale, Johnson, and Adey. I hope I said that right. And then you got four offensive linemen starters coming back. Uh, as good as the rushing offense was towards the end of the season, overall, they were number 71 in rushing success rate. So you got to hope that they come out of the out of the gate banging right off the bat. My question at quarterback, is Grant Gunnell, who transferred in from Memphis, um, is he going to beat out Austin on? Uh, and now I've got to double-check and make sure that my notes were right on this because I, I don't know. I thought Grant Gunnell maybe went over to somewhere else. I thought he went to Auburn. And, of course, this is great radio for me to be doing this right in the middle of the show. But I do want to double-check the roster and make sure that I've got the right stuff. Uh, North Texas quarterback, yeah, Grant Gunnell, transferred in, senior, uh, 85.62 rating. Yeah, okay, okay, let's uh, let's talk about it. Let's see what we got here. 
Uh, I, that's what I want to know. Is, is Grant Gunnell going to, like he transferred from Memphis, he didn't get to play at Memphis last year. He was the presumed starter for the Tigers last season, but he went out with an injury before the first game. And then, of course, Seth Hennigan took over for the Tigers. No reason for him to stick around. And honestly, he couldn't go into a better place. North Texas, I, from what I understand, still not totally sold on old Austin there. Uh, he he has not been great. I mean, he's 29 years old. He played six years with the Yankees minor league organization. He still isn't doing the things that Seth Luttrell needs. They got three starting wide, return, uh, wide receivers returning. This is a team that is talented enough and and yet hadn't been able to get it out of them. Uh, they were number 112 in passing success rate last year. So there you go. I, the offense has to produce better this season uh, because the defense is going to take a bit of a step back. As far as defense, four two five scheme, it took a hit when the uh, the defensive line, Murphy Brothers, of course, transferred over to UCLA. Arkansas transfer Enoch, um, the nose guard, Roderick Brown. Uh, he earned CUSA freshman honors. The back seven is experienced here. Linebacker stacked with KD Davis, Larry Nixon third, Kevin Wood. Defensive backs only returned two starters, but there is talent in the secondary. I I feel okay about the defense. Uh your your sixty two percent returning production is okay. It's number seventy one in the country, but I don't know that they're going to be able to do what they did last season, right? The rushing success rate they were number seventeen in rushing success rate allowed last year. Without the Murphy brothers, I don't know that you're going to be able to reproduce that. I don't know that you can replicate. Uh, looking at the keys to the season here, offense significantly more talented than the defense, uh, but the defense was the strong suit last year. Can they carry the load again? And I don't believe that they can to the same extent. Latrell's offense needs a spark in the passing game. Uh, can On take another step? Uh, Oni, however you say his last name, I never know. Uh, or is Gunnell the better option? That's what I want to know. Um, and then finally, you got to clean up the turnovers. You got to clean up the penalties. You got to be able to finish drives better. They were not good in that regard last year. Penalties per game, number 109. Uh, you can't have that if you've got like a number 65 turnover margin. You just you can't beat yourself in these games. They've got to be better at that. So play better fundamental football, and this team could be really, really good. Uh, oh, yes, my projected record here, 7-5 and five for this team. I could see anywhere from five wins to eight wins, anywhere in between. I like 7-5 and five here. Uh, got losses to SMU, Memphis, UTSA, Western Kentucky, and UAB. There's a lot of other ones that I could see them. Like, maybe they lose at UTEP, or maybe they end up beating uh, Western Kentucky, something like that. Uh, but I think this is an, a good football team, not great football team. We'll see. We will see. Thanks for listening to the Winning Cures Everything podcast. The website is winningcureseverything.com, and if you want to connect with us, we're on Twitter, at GaryWCE, at ChrisBGiannini, at Winning Cures, or you can email us, Gary at winningcureseverything.com or Chris at winningcureseverything.com. Subscribe everywhere you need to subscribe, and we'll see you soon.